Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Steve Leibowitz, and coming up in today's newscast. After 12 weeks of raging protest, Netanyahu finally pauses judicial overhaul. Opposition leaders indicate willingness to enter negotiations immediately. And the Hista Drut ends the labor strike after the Prime Minister's announcement. After much anticipation and mass demonstrations underway, Prime Minister Netanyahu last night finally announced a halt to the coalition's divisive plan for judicial overhaul. Acknowledging the deep rift in society after 12 weeks of mass protests and disruption, Netanyahu said the words that could lead to an end of the crisis. <laughs> החלטתי להשהות, להשהות בה, את הקריאה השנייה והשלישית של החוק במושב הזה של הכנסת, כדי לתת זמן לנסות להגיע לאותה הסכבה רחבה לקראת החקיקה במהלך הכנסת הבאה. נתניהו פרמס that judicial overhaul will still be passed, but hopefully with wide agreement. אנחנו עומדים על הצורך. להביא את התיקונים הנחוצים במערכת המשפט וניתן הזדמנות כדי להשיג אותם בהסכבה רחבה זו מטרה ראויה מעין כמוה. נתניהו פרייז דה אופנס אוף נשיונל יוניטי לידר בני גנץ אבל אוסו וורנד דאט וויטה וויטאוט אגרימנט ג'ודישל רפורם וויד אולטימטלי בי קריד אאוט. כך או כך נביא רפורמה שתחזיר את האיזון שעבד בין הרשויות תוך שימור The Prime Minister finished with a message of unity, promising that the country will now together mark the forthcoming Passover, Remembrance Day, and Independence Day holidays. For we all have the same destiny and the same purpose, to ensure eternal Israel. After Prime Minister Netanyahu's announcement of a pause, the major opposition groups in the Knesset generally accepted the Prime Minister's invitation for negotiations of judicial reform that could soon begin, hosted by President Herzog. National Unity Party Chief Benny Gantz promptly welcomed Netanyahu's decision to delay the judicial overhaul after saying, better late than never. Gantz says his party is ready for negotiations at the president's residence. Opposition leader Yair Lapid expressed doubt about Netanyahu's sincerity, but agreed to dialogue and said it must end with the Constitution. Lapid also called for the reinstatement of Defense Minister Gallant. I call to Netanyahu, Batel the Pitorim of Yoav Gallant. The United States is not able to get this in front of the Sikunim in all the Zeros to allow itself to get the Sikunim in all the Zeros. From the world, we are not able to get the Sikunim in the Zeros. The Sikunim is in the Zeros, the Sikunim is in the Zeros, the Sikunim is in the Zeros, the Sikunim is in the Zeros. President Herzog said the decision to delay the overhaul push is the right thing and urged genuine, serious, and responsible talks that will urgently calm the spirits and lower the flames. The opposition has reportedly appointed teams that would enter into negotiations with representatives of the coalition in an effort to reach a wide consensus on judicial reform. So we know the news is volatile and fast-paced, and we want to let you know that ILTV's new app is now available. So if you want to stay connected to the latest news from Israel, the Middle East, and the Jewish world, download our app now on all your devices. It's available in the App Store for both Android and iPhone. The coalition parties would likely take a hit in popularity if elections were held today. This according to two new polls conducted even before the judicial overhaul delay and the firing of Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. The polls showed Benny Gantz is centrist, National Unity Party gaining some 10 Knesset seats from its current 12, largely at the expense of Netanyahu's Likud. One poll conducted by Channel 12 News indicated that the public may be clamoring for a more centrist government in light of the turmoil that has unfolded ever since the current government formed at the start of the year. According to the polls, the current coalition could see their seats drop from 64 to 54 seats, bringing them seven seats short of forming a coalition. 
Meanwhile, the opposition bloc, which consists of National Unity, Yesh Atid, Yisrael Beitenu, Meretz, Ram, and Labor, would get the coveted 61 seats, with the remaining going to the non-aligned Hadash Tal. The second poll, conducted by Khan Public Broadcasting, showed similar results, with the current coalition hovering at 53 seats and the previous government getting 62. As for a gauge in how the country views the current leadership, the Khan poll shows Prime Minister Netanyahu neck and neck with Yeshatid's Yair Lapid with 31% of respondents favoring the former and 32% in favor of a Lapid-run government. Even stronger, 37% would favor Benny Gantz at the helm of a government, compared to 30% for Netanyahu. Finally, as for the judicial overhaul itself, Channel 12 and Khan both revealed that the public is in favor of pausing the reforms for the time being, with about 63% voting to halt legislation for now. And I am pleased to be joined now by two veteran observers of the Israeli scene, legendary Israeli TV host Yaakov Achimir and pollster Mitchell Barak. Yaakov, if I could, I'd like to, to start with you. The people of Israel waited the entire day yesterday, and indeed weeks, for Prime Minister Netanyahu to finally say the word pause. Are we now at the beginning of the end of this event, or at the end of the beginning? I think, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to you and to Michael. I think, in my opinion, it's only the very beginning of a process. I think that this process will last for the next uh, few months. It's not the end of the crisis, but uh, as I said before, it's only the beginning. I think that this uh, crisis will accompany the Israeli public for the next uh, few months. But uh, I'm not impressed by the polls that you show just now, because uh, I don't think that Netanyahu lost his, uh, how shall I say, his uh, uh, character, you know, his... Uh, uh, ability to 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 campaign and so on and so forth. So I don't think that this is an indication uh, for the next uh, Knesset election in uh, Israel. All right, Mitchell, if I could turn to you. You used to work in the prime minister's office, uh, Mitchell, and um, some years ago. Were you surprised that it took so long for Netanyahu to make a decision on this on this issue? Well, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I mean, I've worked with Netanyahu many years ago. I understand at least how he operates. I mean, I think in general, the thing that has, uh, you know, identified his management style or how he leads, he, he likes a certain level of managed chaos. You know, when there's chaos in his government, chaos among coalition partners, chaos in Israel, uh, he actually does well because he doesn't really have to move anything forward. And he can just let the forces play out. I think he was a little bit shocked here at the level of the chaos that took place uh, when he, oh, and this has only really happened when he fired uh, Gallant. Meaning, if you look at when he came out last week, uh, he was full speed ahead, and he might have pushed this through had there not been that last, uh, you know, upsurge uh, of protest after he fired Gallant. So I, you know, I think he was kind of forced into this. I mean, even the world pressure against him and pressure from the United States and the shekel, you know, somewhat crashing and the economy and the startup nation, you know, I think he felt it was all collateral damage. He'll push it through and everything will come back on. So I did think it took him a little bit too long to get there, and he was kind of forced into it when he had people in his own party starting to peel away, including Gallant. You know, once he found that 64 is not 64, it's really 63 because it's not clear if uh, Yuli Edelstein would have showed up again, uh, he's got a problem passing the legislation. And so, you know, this was a necessity for him to stop it anyway because it didn't look like he was going to push it through. All right, well, Yaakov, you said that this could be around with us for a number of months uh, to go. At the end of the day, do you see a real consensus that could be reached that, let's say, what about the word constitution? Can Israel come out of this actually better off and have a real constitution? Well, I don't know how, how long uh, will it last, but I think that, uh, first of all, Netanyahu has to solve this uh, a crisis, uh, as uh, I think, uh, for for the time being, and then I think that he will be back to his uh, 
activities and his uh, performance, his very well uh, known uh, performance. But uh, I think that if I want, I want to say a few words about the relation between the Israeli public and the Prime Minister vis a vis this uh, crisis. I think that uh, it was. Uh, there was a major uh, mistake which was done by the Prime Minister and by the Defense Minister, Mr. Gallant, and uh, of course the Minister of Justice, uh, Mr. Levine, because the Israeli public was surprised, you know, by this uh, plan. There was no uh, preliminary uh, discussions or uh, warning uh, that uh, such a plan uh, will come, will be uh, presented to to the public, I this 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 was I think one of the causes of the of the crisis. I mean the surprise of the of the public, uh, which uh, was unaware of this uh, uh, plan. And as for the for the future, I mean I I, I cannot forecast of course the future, but I feel knowing uh, Mr. Netanyahu as an Israeli citizen. I think that he will overcome this uh, crisis. He's, uh, he is a kind of uh, master of uh, politics. Uh, maybe I'm too naive, but I think that this is my, these are my feelings uh, today. Mitchell, let, let me turn to you as the pollster in this. A big poll came out in a few different TV stations. Netanyahu took a major hit at the expense, expense of Benny Gantz. Is this lasting damage done to Netanyahu's popularity? No, not at all. I, would, I wouldn't pay attention to it because some of the polls you see, some of the smaller parties are hovering between four and five. So, you know, either way, you know, this could turn and Netanyahu could have a majority. But the campaign hasn't even started, meaning he's already got his campaign slogan. It's us against the leftist anarchists funded by George Soros. You know, they want to destabilize. They don't even go to the army anymore. If they don't like, you know, some of the policies, they're not going to go to the army. Of course, we have to defeat them. So he's got a great campaign. What I do think is significant at this point is, yes, there does seem to be a drop among Likud voters because a lot of them were caught off guard for this. And, you know, it's not just Netanyahu and Levine and Derry uh, against everyone else. It's them against every former head of the Shabak, head of the Mossad, former attorney general, meaning they went up a, a, amongst a very, very serious group of people. And so for a lot of those people, those people are really serious and they're professionals and they have nothing in this game. So you want to look at what they say. But what I is, do think significant is from those polls is the fact that uh, both Lapid and Gantz are gaining, meaning they're looking more and more like leaders and more and more like kind of stable leadership. Meaning the one thing you could say about uh, Bennett and Lapid and their last government was things did calm down and they did seem to work well. And I think that a lot of people may want to go back to that kind of stability, which they're not getting. They're getting divisiveness from Netanyahu. They always will get divisiveness. In his speech last night, there was negatives against the left and, uh, you know, a lot of misinformation. And up until now, it's divisiveness. And so we'll see what happens in the next election, but it's too early to, uh, you know, uh, write the obituary, the political obituary of Benjamin Netanyahu. All right, Yaakov, I'm sorry we ran out of time because I really wanted to ask you about the role of the media in this entire event. We're going to have to leave that for the next time uh, that we meet. Thank you both so much uh, for, joining, for joining me today. Well, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant has yet to receive his letter of dismissal from Prime Minister Netanyahu and remains on the job, at least for the time being. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's ousting of Defense Minister Yoav Gallant sparked uproar across the country this week. Now his future in the Defense Ministry and the coalition seems to be up in the air. Gallant was fired for calling to put an end to the judicial overhaul legislation in a televised address. Yet the defense minister has never received official notice of his termination as of Monday's evening. Many lawmakers have rallied in favor of Gallen, calling on him to be reinstated. One of those lawmakers is rumored to be Shah's head, Ali Derry. According to reports by Khan Public Radio, Derry is livid that Gallen was fired and is one of the voices calling on Netanyahu to walk back on his decision. 
To make his firing official, Netanyahu must serve him with a signed letter and 48 hours' notice. Netanyahu has yet to do so. In the meantime, Netanyahu is said to held talks with current agriculture minister, former Shin Bet chief Avi Dichter, who may replace Gallant as defense minister. Gallant warned the public Saturday night that the current crisis provides ample opportunity for Israelis' enemies to strike and that the country cannot afford to be torn apart by internal politics. His speech ignited massive protests throughout Sunday night and into the next day. Well, those who missed their flights yesterday can breathe a sigh of relief. The brief general strike called yesterday by the Histadrut Labor Union ended shortly after the Prime Minister's announcement. The immediate impact included the reopening of Ben Gurion Airport. This allowed dozens of delayed flights to take off overnight. The stoppage was part of widespread strikes announced by the workers' union in protest of the judicial reform. This was the first time in Israeli history that the Histadru Trade Union Federation and the main employers joined together in calling a general strike. This led to massive disruptions over the course of the day. All services are resuming, however. For anti-overhaul protesters, pausing legislation is not enough, and they announced that they will continue to take to the streets until the plans to reform the government are completely dropped from the agenda. And well, joining us now is Hanadi Saeed, founder and CEO of the exciting Israeli startup Sensai. Sensai provides AI-based anomaly detection and root cause analysis, enabling real-time resolution of issues Please explain that to us in layman's terms. Perfect. Thank you for having me. So just to give a little bit of context, um, maybe you and our viewers would remember about a year ago, a bit more, Facebook went down for six, seven hours because of cloud and data center issues, costing millions of dollars. Same thing a month later, AWS went down because of cloud issues. Uh, it was their third outage in a month. What we come to do is help cloud managers understand what's happening in their environment using artificial intelligence to be able to tell what's happening, why it's happening. In real time. In real time and what they can do about it. And all of this is automated without human intervention and without the need to jump between tools, teams and people. Now you're in a fundraising phase of development of, of your startup and I hear it's going very well. Is that accurate? Correct. We're doing uh, bridge financing with Exit Valley. When we decided to do this step, we did our homework and examined the alternatives on the market. We decided to go on uh, with Exit Valley. It took a couple of months of us doing due diligence on them, they doing due diligence on us, and we've decided to go ahead with this uh, successful campaign so far. Well, how, how do you know when the process is going well enough? Are you reaching your goal or even exceeding your goal of raising funds to make this happen? Yes, thankfully we've reached our goal uh, about a month into the campaign and now we're um, exceeding our goal. We're more than 150% um, fundraising and we're continuing because we keep getting interest. But the exciting thing is uh, we didn't only get the attention of um, uh, potential investors, but also development partners who saw our campaign on, are reaching out for potential partnership with Sensei. But why is that? Did they have faith in your staff in particular or for past accomplishments? Why are the investors coming to you now? Um, I think it's because of three main reasons. First, our technology is tangible. The problem we are uh, solving is tangible. People understand cloud outages. They feel them, they survive them. And many of us are working since COVID, but even before that with um, online banking, learning from home, um, e-travel and so on. So we do understand the impact of cloud outages. So it's a tangible problem. And we sit on the intersection of both cloud, which is experiencing at least 20% growth year after year, and artificial intelligence, which is experiencing about 40% growth. So it's very exciting for investors to be on, on these two intersections, cloud and artificial intelligence. Second is the team. We're highly experienced people in high tech business, uh, both the full-time Sensei employees, the board and advisors are top tier. And also uh, we see that investors are attracted to the diversity that we provide in terms of gender, age, ethnical background and professional background. Um, so I think we can think of it as well, us attracting all of where does it go? Where does it go from here? What are the next steps for Sensei? I mean, it, it, it sounds very exciting. 
So product-wise, we are currently doing uh, proof of concepts in the US, and we're looking to launch the product end of this year in North American market. Um, R&D-wise, we're working very hard on the prediction component of our tool, which will be available a year and a half after launch. And fundraising-wise, we're continuing with this uh, bridge fundraising campaign with Exit Valley and also doing uh, VC uh, Roadshow as well. Just finally, let me ask you this out of curiosity. Uh, when you were a little girl, is this what you wanted to be? I mean, how did you come to this? Being an entrepreneur, uh, I never thought I would be here, but going back, I took entrepreneurship um, like um, after school program at the age of 13, and then I under, um, studied entrepreneurship in my MBA. So I thought it was a hobby, but it ended up being a career for me. So. And now, and this is all going to take place in Israel. This, uh, this company will be completely run from Israel, or you have partners in other countries? We have partners in the North American market. R&D is currently only in Israel, and the partnership we have in the U.S. is for continued development and mainly go-to-market. Uh, what is the staff currently, and what size staff do you see once you've become a fully developed post uh, high tech company? So we are a lean startup currently located in the Haifa area. Um, we have staff in Israel and in neighboring countries as well. Um, we're less than 10 people and we're looking to grow to hundreds, if not thousands, hopefully in the near future. Well, I can only wish you best luck uh, and good luck to you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for being with us. Well, New England Patriots owner and American Jewish philanthropist Robert Kraft has launched a $25 million campaign to combat anti-Semitism in the United States. The Stand Up to Jewish Hate campaign aims to raise nationwide awareness of the rising plight. ILTV's William Sharon reports. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, and Kraft is determined to help stop it. What's happening now to me looks similar to what was going on in Germany in the late 30s. The campaign launched by Patriots owner Robert Kraft will feature emotive ads intend to tug at the heartstrings of non-Jewish Americans. The Jewish people represent 2.4% of the population, but they receive 55% of the hate crimes. That really prompted me to start this new foundation. The campaign launch follows last week's release of a report by the Anti-Defamation League asserting that anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. rose 36% in 2022. So in this room near his office in Gillette Stadium Morning everyone. is the foundation to combat anti-Semitism that tracks and responds to anti-Semitism online. We're monitoring all the things that are being said and come into us about anti-Semitism. Jews were the most targeted of all U.S. religious groups in 2022 in 21 major cities, accounting for 78% of religious hate crimes. Let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected tonight, with lows averaging around 11 degrees Celsius or 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And tomorrow we can expect cloudy skies alongside steady top temperatures, seeing highs of around 21 degrees Celsius or 69 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Steve Liebowitz. Be well. Thanks for watching. Much love from Israel.